I want you to go with me to the book of Matthew, chapter 16, verse 13. It says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? What does the world say about Jesus? Good man, a prophet. Most, a lot of them don't know him, don't believe in him. Some of them don't believe he ever existed. Historically, he did exist. Historically, he was crucified. Historically, he was raised from the dead. And historically, he has changed more people, more people's lives than any other human being that ever set foot on this planet. And the book that talks about him is the best-selling book of all times and it will never be caught up by any other book. Amen. There's more Bible sold than any other book in the world so much that it's not even put on the list. Amen. Amen. But it says, who, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Now I can say this, who did your mama say Jesus was? Who did your daddy say Jesus was? Who do your friends say Jesus is? Who do your coworkers say? It doesn't matter what they say. Because the next thing says, so they said, some say John the Baptist and some Elijah and some, and others say Jeremiah, one of the prophets. In other words, they don't know. They're saying all kind of different stuff. And then he said to them, here's the big question. But who do you say that I am? Now, we're talking about faith. We've been talking about the fruit of the Spirit. We've been talking about being fruitful. The first words that God said to man was to be fruitful. Then he said, multiply. So we're being fruitful. He said, he said to them, male and female, be fruitful and multiply. And we're talking about the fruit of the Spirit. And so one of the fruit of the Spirit, and we're on this one right now, is faithfulness. So I want to still talk about faith. It's such a big deal having faith. Amen. If you lose your faith, you're lost. People can take everything else away from you, but whenever you, someone steals your faith, if the devil steals your faith or you lose your faith, then you are in a bad place. Now, when he said, who do men say that I am? That's what other people believe. It's about faith. When he says, who do you say that I am? This is what do you believe? That's what he's talking about. He says, what is your trust? What do you put your faith in? What have you come to know? And Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, which means you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Guys, listen, this is the right answer. Amen. And you don't say it just because somebody else said it. You, said it, you say it because you truly believe it. Amen. And that's what he's talking about here. He's not just talking, well, mama said he's the Christ, so I'm going to believe what mama said. You better get in touch with Jesus and find out what God is saying, and you need to hear it from God. I, I went to church for years and years. I did the traditional thing, and I never truly had a revelation that Jesus Christ was real and alive. I knew there was a God, but I did not understand who Jesus was. I didn't understand that he died on the cross so that my sins would be forgiven, that his blood was shed, that I could have a blood covenant with Almighty God that would be an eternal agreement with God through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Sealed in blood, the blood of our Savior and our God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Sworn by his own oath that he would give us the gift of eternal life. He could swear by none higher, so he swore by himself. And if we would lie, he, he, his existence would, would be over with. That's something we learned last week, right? God is all-knowing. God is all-powerful. God is all-present. God never lies and God never changes. Amen, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And because of that, he's always faithful. Yes, You're not God. Amen. Somebody needs to get this. You're not God, so quit trying to be God. Quit trying to figure it all out and quit blaming God for the things that go on because you think you know better than God. Because what you're going to do, you're going to lose your faith in that God is good. You're going to lose faith that God is faithful. You're going to lose faith that God is love. But to those who reject him, they're going to stand before him. And he is so faithful, he will judge as he says he will judge in his word. 
See, we don't like to hear that part. Oh, preach on the grace and the mercy of God. Don't preach on the faithfulness that he said that if you reject me, I reject you. I don't reject him. I believe in him. So let, let's see what's going on here. He says, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, excuse me, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. I'm blessed. Are you blessed? Amen. This is Peter he's talking to. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. Faith that comes from God to believe in God is what saving faith is. You can't conjure up your own faith. God's going to give you the faith. Isn't that amazing? He's so grace, gracious and merciful that he gives you the measure of faith you need to believe in his truth, his gospel. So one day I was living my life and my life was a mess. I was a successful worker, but I also loved to party and go on the weekends and do all the crazy stuff that uh, young people do. Amen? Amen? And believe me, everybody kind of goes crazy a little while sometime. Amen. We don't all do crazy the same way, but everybody does crazy. Amen? Amen? I know some of y'all some good crazy people, but I was a bad crazy person. <laughs> you was a good sinner. Amen? Amen? I'm going to tell you, gossiping about somebody is just as bad as committing adultery, Amen. according to God. And the consequences can be just as bad because when you talk about somebody, it's the same as murder, is what the scripture says, when you attack their character. So don't, don't start putting your, listen, everybody does crazy sometimes. Amen? You can say, quote, Mark Crawford. So let, let, let me just add this one thinking about it. Don't ever put a, uh, uh, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Don't ever make an eternal decision about a temporary issue. Amen? Amen. Don't do anything. I'll never talk to him again. Well, because he was crazy for one day or a week. One day you're going to have to eat those words and you're going, to have, you're going to end up talking to him or her. Amen? Oh, here it is. Don't make a permanent decision for a temporary problem. And, and you know what a permanent decision for a temporary problem is for some people? They commit suicide. Because something that's temporary and they're impatient to let God's faithfulness work in the midst of it and they try to make a decision, and it's a wrong decision, and they're making a permanent decision about a temporary situation. This too will pass. Amen. Amen? Keep your eyes on Jesus. That's for somebody watching on television, or somebody here might need to hear that. You, not, you, you don't quit. Your life doesn't belong to you. It belongs to God. Amen? Amen? So he says, right, he says, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. So I was going through my life and all of a sudden, God decided to reveal himself to me. And when people started talking to me about Jesus, I finally could hear because my ears were open. I could finally see because my eyes were open. And I could believe because God was revealing this to me. And once I received it, I did not receive it as words from men. I received it as a word and a revelation from God. Amen. Because if... Man talks you into it, the enemy is going to send a man to talk you out of it or a woman to talk you out of it. When you hear the gospel preached and you come alive and you, your spirit jumps up in you and you believe it and you receive it, that's a supernatural act of the Spirit of God revealing to you the truth about who Jesus Christ is. The gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and his purpose for dying for you on the cross. And the Bible tells us whenever Jesus taught about the sower, so is the word. That whenever the word falls on the, on the path, the birds come and eat it. The devil comes and snatches it away. That's why I love when people come in, they get excited. Some even, people even walk to the front. But by a week's time, there's, they, they're not believing. Then it falls again. It falls in the stony ground where it's, it's shallow ground. The seed gets in there. It begins to come alive quickly, it talks about. And then it says, but when persecution 
and, and, and offense comes because of the word you received, we fall away. In other words, the enemy is going to make sure to send someone into your path to talk you out of what God is saying. So if you receive it as a word from man, then they can say, well, you just, the devil's going to send someone and say, that, that's just a word of man. You, you don't need to live. But if it comes out of here and it's revealed to you by the Holy Spirit, that's what changes lives. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Faith comes to you because of the word of God illuminated by the Holy Spirit. And that's what's happening here. The father is revealing to Peter the truth about who Jesus Christ is. And one day in my life, the father God, God Almighty, supernaturally by the spirit revealed to me who Jesus Christ really was. So when someone came to try to steal it out of my heart, I said, too late. I didn't learn it from you. God revealed himself to me. God showed me. I bowed my knee, not because of what a man said. I bowed my knee because of a revelation I had of who Jesus Christ was. And for the first time in my life, I knew that there was a God and he sent his son and that my sins could be forgiven and that I could start my life over. This is the gospel that needs to be preached everywhere we go. I like to sometimes get into deeper things and talk about the other stories in the Bible. But the greatest story of all is how Jesus loved us and went to the cross. And he could have called for a legion of angels to take him off the cross. But love for you and me kept him on the cross. He died. His blood was shed. He was buried, put in the grave. And three days later, God raised him from the dead. And everyone who puts their trust and faith in him will live forever with him. I was excited to know that God was going to forgive all my sins. Because I had a lot of them. Amen? My chalkboard had a bunch. I needed mine erased. And when I found out, he said, you know what? You can start over with a clean slate with me. It's called being born again. I'm like, I'm going to be born again. And then I found out I was this baby Christian. And, and, and I, but I believed in Jesus. And God was just doing these miracles for me, revealing himself to me. At the same time, I was being persecuted. I was being cussed at by my daddy. Come on. Rejected by my family because I wasn't doing it their way no more. Which half of them didn't do anything. They'd rather me be a drug addict and a drunk than be a a born-again Christian. Woo, y'all don't shout me down now. That's how it was back in the 80s. Amen. Yep. Amen. Getting baptized in that cult? Oh, you going to that church? You're going to get baptized? That's a cult over there. But the, you never directed my life. You never showed me anything about how to walk. The only time I ever heard my dad ever say anything about God was when I was like 18, 17. I was at a seminar and the guy was talking, to one of the uh, motivational speakers was speaking and he, he said, and you got to have the fear of God. And I never really heard. I might have heard it, but I never caught it. I said, I said, Dad, what does he mean by the fear of God? That's the only time my dad ever shared anything that he knew about God. Until after I got born again. And then I found out at my grandmother's funeral in North Carolina that when my dad was a boy, he would get up on Sunday by himself and walk down the street and go to church all by himself when he was a boy. But then something happened that offended him and he quit going to church. He got mad at God. And it might have been because his mama got married four times. See, things happen and we get offended. And then when we get offended... We want to question God or blame God and then we turn from God instead of to God. But you know what? Before he died, he gave his life back to Jesus Christ. He walked down the aisle and asked Jesus to be the Lord of his life and three weeks later, he passed away in love with Jesus. He wasn't cussing me out no more. He was saying, I'm so proud of you and what you've been doing. Before my mama died, she was sitting right over there, right behind where y'all are. That was her spot. She became a member of our church and was faithful to come. Born again, loved Jesus, went through the same persecution I did too, 
But she want, this is where she wanted to be. She wanted to be at church hearing the word of God and listening to her son preach the gospel. Amen. And when she died, she went on to be with Jesus. Amen. Amen. Guys, we don't like to talk about it, but in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, it says, there's a time to be born and there's a time to die. Guys, everybody's going to die unless the rapture comes. And everybody been waiting on the rapture since it was revealed in, in Acts chapter 2, the end times. And when that happens, we got to put our trust and our faith in who Jesus really is. Amen. He is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And I know that. And I put my confidence in that. So therefore, I can prepare. Prepare in faith that whenever someone that I love dies, that I can handle it. Because I have real faith. I'm going to sorrow, but the Bible says you'll sorrow and hope. Amen? I got to be ready. Amen? Because one day, you know what? I'm going to die. One day, Stacy's going to pass away. My wife. Don't know who's going to go first. But all we know is if you come to our funeral dressed in black, we're going to get up out the coffin and come and say, go put on some colors. That's what she told me. She said, you're going to come celebrate, put on all the colors of the rainbow except black. Yeah. And celebrate because we believe. Amen. 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 We trust in the Lord. And we really believe that we're going to be with the Lord. This is not a fairy tale. This is serious stuff we're talking about here. Amen. And listen, we're not going to a holding place. You either have made your reservation or you don't have your reservation. Amen? Amen? Amen. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. It says that we will be with him and those that are with him when he gets up to come, he's going to bring us with him. That means we're already with him. Amen? Amen? The word of God says, because of the word, because of the promises of God, you can know that you have eternal life. Not guess you have eternal life. I'm not waiting to die to get eternal life. I got my eternal life already. I'm born again. And if you don't have eternal life, then you don't have faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ according to the word of God. Put your faith in Christ and not in your goodness. Put your faith in his finished works and not in your own works and you'll be saved. Get rid of the scale thing that you've been taught. Good deeds, bad deeds, and if you're more good than you're bad, then you get to go to heaven, maybe. Maybe. I'll have to wait and die to see. Oh, I don't want to wait. Amen? I'm going to put my trust in the Lord right now. Jesus Christ took the weight of sin off of Mark and put it on himself. It's that original sin. And no matter what you do, it, the sin scale, you can't do enough works to, to get that. It, you can't do it. Even Mother Teresa could not get rid of her sin without believing in Jesus Christ. Because your faith, he says, he becomes your sin and you become his righteousness by faith. Amen. Not by works. In fact, if you try to do it by your own goodness and your own works, he rejects you because it becomes filthy rags. If you could be good enough to go to heaven, Jesus didn't have to come and die for you. So he died in vain? That's how good you are? I don't know why I'm going to continue on this, but if I drop dead right now, guys, y'all put on some rainbow colors and celebrate because I'm going to be with the Lord. And they said, but that's pretty presumptuous. You must think you something. I know, I know that I'm nothing, and I know that he's everything. Therefore, I'm going in on him and not on me. And just because I have a crazy day doesn't mean I lose my salvation. Amen. Come on. Everybody has some crazy days. Amen. Some of you have some crazy years, but he's still faithful. He's faithful. 
And, and if you're going to be full of faith, your faith better be full of Jesus, not yourself, Amen. not your religion, not even your sacraments. You do the sacraments because you believe. You don't do the sacraments to believe. You don't do the sacraments to get saved. You do the sacraments because you are saved. Amen. Water baptism does not save you, does not justify you. But it's an act of your obedience to God and you should get water baptized once you believe because it's part of the salvation of your soul. That means the, the sanctification. But when you believe in Jesus' death and burial and resurrection, just like the thief on the cross, you are justified before God. That means you're born again, your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, and you're going to be working on all of the rest, your mind, your will, your emotions, your soul. But your spirit is already one with God. You've got the gift of eternal life. And in your spirit, your spirit man is perfect. Because Jesus wouldn't be one with it if it's not. Then for the rest of your life, you're going to let that flow out of you, into your mind, your will, your emotions, out of your body into preaching the gospel to the world, trying to live it out. Because he's going to work out of us what he's put in us. So I'm, I'm justified. That means I'm made right with God. I'm being sanctified. I do water baptism. I do communion. I, I, I'm baptized in the Holy Spirit. I worship God. I serve other people. I do all of these works because I'm saved, and it continues to change me. And then one day, when this old body can't go no more, and believe me, it's slowing down all the time. Because it's changing. It changes. You know how I know? I went to J.C. Penney's and I went to the old clothes rack and it looked like I could wear it, but I had to change clothes racks. I had to go to another one. <laughs> and some of y'all go to the old clothes rack and you think it's all going to fit and you're trying to put all that on. Mm -mm. <laughs> go ahead and get the bigger size. Or maybe some of y'all got a smaller size. Change. We all change. I was looking at some pictures the other day whenever I was a second degree black belt competing in shape, weighed 148 pounds. I said, boy, that's not me. And the Lord says, that was you. <laughs> but change comes. And you are going to get older. The, other, the alternative is just go and be with Jesus. He said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And he says, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. That's an awesome day of your life when the Holy Spirit, the spirit of the living God reveals to you who the son of God really is. And your spirit grabs a hold of it and you believe it and you receive the word and it says you're born again by the incorruptible seed of the word of God. Amen. And God now lives and moves in you and has his being. Then he says this, verse 18, and also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell or Hades shall not prevail against it. Now this is not calling Peter the foundation of the church. He says, okay, you are Peter, which means a pebble, small rock. Then the other word he says, it says upon this rock, which means a massive rock, a foundational rock. I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That rock is the revelation of who Jesus Christ is. He just said, flesh and blood will not, has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And upon the revelation of who Jesus Christ is, I'm building the church. That's the rock. Jesus is the rock. Once you realize that salvation is in Christ alone, then you become like Peter. You become part of the church. And when you read Peter's writings in 1 Peter, he says, you are all living stones built together to have a habitation for the dwelling of God. We're all stones built upon the foundational rock of Jesus Christ. And I don't want to take the time this morning, but I can go scripture to scripture and show you who is the foundation. First Corinthians chapter three, there's only one foundation that can be laid and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And he says, be careful how you build on it. So once I believe that he's the Christ, once I have a revelation from God, from heaven, 
my life is a small rock built upon the massive rock of Jesus Christ and who he is. That's what he said. And when you have a revelation of who Jesus Christ is, hell cannot take it away from you. Amen. The gates of hell cannot steal it from you. And then what does he say after that? It, it, it gets even uh, so amazing. He says, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. The number one key to understanding the kingdom of heaven is understanding that Jesus is the true Messiah. He is the savior of the world. He is God in the flesh, Emmanuel, God with us, getting a revelation of who Jesus Christ really is. He's not one of the old prophets. He's God in the flesh. He laid down his life for you and me. I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Woo, that's good, huh? That means now when I pray, heaven responds. 1 John chapter 5 says this. This is the confidence I have that if I ask anything according to his will, he hears me. And if he hears me, I know that I have the petition that I've asked of him. That's faith and confidence in who Jesus Christ is. In that same book, a chapter before, it says, if your heart condemns you, he's greater than your heart. For he knows all things. But if your heart doesn't condemn you, then you have confidence. So don't look at your heart as the judge of who you are and if you're saved or not, because the heart is deceitful and wicked above all things. Who can know it? That's what it says in Jeremiah chapter 17. But I put my confidence in him. And if I know that I pray according to his will, I will have whatever it is that I ask. Because I believe. What is the first thing you got to believe? That he is who he says he is. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come unto the Father except through him. He said that. That's red letter. He, he is who he says he is. It says no one can come unto the Father except through me. The only way to God is through Jesus Christ because he is God. So these uh, religious beliefs that say there's many ways up the mountain, it doesn't matter if it's Muhammad or if it's Buddha or whoever it is, or, you know, one of the Indian gods, the millions that they have. It doesn't matter. If you believe and you do good, you'll go to heaven. That's not what the book teaches. It says if you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, Again, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God, verse 17 says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. He didn't come to condemn you, but that the world through him might be saved. But he goes on to say, but this is the condemnation that he came into the world and men love darkness rather than light. Do you realize that not everybody likes the light? But you start preaching the word of God about sexual immorality, about lying and cheating and, and anger and hatred and contention and heresy and all these other things and disobedient to parents is one of them. Amen. I mean, all of these things that are listed, he's trying to show us if you will live in the fruit of the spirit instead of the works of the flesh, your life is going to be more peaceful. But when you start preaching that, people love their darkness. Amen. In fact, it says in one place, inventors of evil things. Inventors of evil behavior. Some people, it's not bad enough, they got to invent a more perverted way to do something. Boy, y'all don't need to shout me down right now. And then they say, hey, you know what? You got to tolerate me. Well, I, you can do what you want, but just don't mess with me or my family or my church. I'm a pastor. That means I'm a shepherd. If a wolf wants to come in here and try to start killing sheep, we're going to take out the wolf. If someone comes in here that's got some problems, they're just a sheep that's kind of sick, we're going to help get you delivered and help you. But when you start, start trying to pull people away from God into some kind of fantasy, uh, perverted world, we're going to talk to you. And, or God's going to deal with you. God's not going to allow you to hurt his sheep. But you know, just because somebody's got problems, that doesn't mean they're a wolf. 
Come on. There might just be a, a sheep that's going astray. A sick sheep, they need some help. Amen? They need to find out who Jesus Christ really is. They need to learn how to bind and loose. They need some deliverance to be set free. That's why don't be so quick to judge. In fact, sheep, if there's a wolf here, it's not your job to fight the wolf because the wolf's going to tear you up. Let the shepherd and the leadership fight the wolf. We're the, shepherd, we're the shepherds. We'll take care of the, the, the wolf and the bear and the lion. Amen? Amen. But you got to trust God and trust your leadership. Amen? And again, some people come in and don't judge them. Because a young lady could come in here and doesn't know the difference of, of modesty yet because she hadn't been taught. And somebody would come, are you going to deal with that young lady the way she's dressing? Uh, and I'll, I'll talk to him. I'll say, why? Well, you know, she might cause somebody to lust after her. Well, I said, well, the Bible says if you lust after her, you've committed adultery. You better watch your lust problem. Amen. Didn't say nothing about the way the woman was dressed. Talked about the man lusting. Ooh, nobody wants to talk about that side. Amen. It's just like Adam and Eve. They always want to bl blame Eve, but Adam was there when Eve ate the tree. Amen. Eve was deceiving. Adam wasn't. But that's a, he says, it's, it's that woman you gave me. Lie. You were there. You ate it. It's funny how God went to Adam first instead of Eve. So what you do is you begin to love somebody. Teach them the word of God. Let their faith get activated. Amen? Amen? Understand that one day God may use that young lady or young man to change people's lives because of the experiences that they went through, because of the tattoos they got on their body, because of whatever it is that you might judge them for right now. God can turn that around and use it to change other people's lives. Amen. You're not the church police. Amen. Let the Holy Spirit do it and you're going to see some change take place. Give room for God to do the convicting. Because if they change because you told them to, then they can just be offended at you, and that's not the word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. So when the word of God comes to you, and there's something you're doing that you need to change, you're going to change because you got a revelation that God wants you to change. And that's what true change is. So when I preach about all these things, I'm not judging you. Because such was one of me at one time. That's what the Bible says. You were just like that at one time. But as the Holy Spirit's worked on me and the Word of God's worked on me and things have come to things have changed. Say change. Change, change is good. Except in the offering. I don't know where that came from. So when the gospel gets preached, I'm going to try to wrap this up here. When the gospel is being preached, faith rises in people's hearts or rejection of the gospel rises up in people's hearts. There's always two responses to the gospel. Acts chapter 2 verse 37. This is the first, gospel, the first time Peter preaches the gospel after the resurrection. It's the day of Pentecost. They're all filled with the Holy Spirit. He talks about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Then he says this, and when they heard this, when they heard the gospel about the resurrection of Christ, how they crucified him, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? When they heard it, they believed it, and it convicted their hearts. It cut down to their conscience. Amen? Amen. Just like the woman that was caught in adultery, it says, whenever Jesus wrote on the ground, it says, let he was out, out sin, cast the first stone. It says they were convicted in their conscience. Amen. And therefore, they could not stone because they realized that they had their own problems. So they hear the gospel preached, and they turn, and here's a faith response. Men and brethren, what shall we do? What's the next group? Verse. And Peter said to them, repent, every one of you, and be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sin, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The response is to do the will of God, 
to move towards God, not away from God. And as you go on and read, it says 3,000 souls were added to the church that day. That's the best response. When I was in Africa and I was preaching the gospel, <clears throat> Muslims, probably oh, 10,000 Muslims, and there was Christians there too. There was about 15, 20,000 people. When the gospel began to be preached, demons began to manifest. Others began to run to give their lives to Jesus Christ. Then over 2,500 people were converted from Muslims to Christians. 2,500 people. And actually signed paper and cards and to be ministered to and followed up by the churches in the area. Now let's go to Acts chapter 7. Verse 54. Stephen's preaching here. And man, he was preaching up a storm. He started from the beginning of the Bible all the way through. And he got down to talking about Jesus. And of course, the religious people. You know, sinners are easier to convert than religious people. Because you're stuck in your false belief system. And you believe that what you have is true. And the Bible talks about this in one place. I, in fact, I got uh, some notes on it. Come back Wednesday night, we'll talk about it. But it says that what you believe to be true is true to you. Do you realize that? The Apostle Paul talked about it. He says one day a, a person uh, believes one day is for the Lord and the other day is not for the Lord. One person believes that this food is, is eaten unto the Lord and the other one believes that you're not supposed to eat this food. He said, be convinced in your own conscience. Be convinced in your own mind. Because however you believe it to be is what you're going to act on. Amen. But then he has this great verse that he ends it with. He says, but the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's the context of that scripture. Okay, But if you believe it's, it's a sin to have a glass of wine, then to you it's a sin to have a glass of wine. Okay? But just because you see somebody else having a glass of wine, you don't need to be calling them a sinner. Because the other person might be able to have a glass of wine and not be in sin because they're not a drunkard. You might be a drunkard. So as you are fully convinced, to whoever thinks something is clean, it's clean. To a person who thinks it's unclean, it's unclean. So when you, if you think it's a sin to have a glass of wine and you drink a glass of wine, your conscience is convicting you. Amen. But another person might not think it's a sin and doesn't believe it's a sin to have a glass of wine because they read John chapter 2 where the, Jesus turned the water into wine and they all drank it. And so they're convinced in their own heart that it's not a sin to have a glass of wine. That's if your glass isn't this big. <laughs> and it's the same thing about food, about anything. Some people think that you're not supposed to eat anything non-kosher. That mean, If y'all don't know what that means, like a pig or, you know, a squirrel. And that, that half of us occasions say, what are we going to eat? No. And other people believe all you're supposed to eat is kosher, and other people believe you can eat anything. And in fact, the apostle Peter was of the persuasion that he wasn't supposed to eat anything unless it was clean or kosher. That's what that means, biblically clean. And he was on the roof of a house in Joppa, and God let down a sheet and had all kind of animals in it. And he said, kill and eat. And Peter said, I don't eat anything unclean. God let the sheet down three times. He said, kill and eat, kill and eat. And then God said, don't call something unclean that I've made clean. Amen. And he says, there's three men coming to meet you and they're Gentiles. And I want you to go to the Gentiles' house and preach the gospel. Because they hadn't preached the gospel to the Gentiles. And the Gentiles could eat some pork. The Gentiles ate everything. And he goes to the Gentiles' house, and while he's preaching the gospel, the Holy Spirit falls on that house, and all the men and women in that house begin to be filled with the Holy Spirit and bank, begin to speak with other tongues. And Peter said, since they believe, who's going to forbid them from being baptized? And he brought the Gentiles into the kingdom of God. Then later on, he's eating at, uh, uh, I think it's Philippi, 
And here comes the cronies from, from Jerusalem, all the hierarchy of the religion, and he's over there eating with the Gentiles. In other words, he's having some pork chops. And when he sees, them, sees these religious people, the Jews, coming, he separates himself from the Gentiles and pretends he's not eating the unclean food. And Paul rebukes him in front of all of them. He said, you're playing the hypocrite. You're eating when they're there, but now you want to act like you're not eating whenever the religious people come? It's some good reading right there. The Bible's real. Amen? Now let's look at this. He's preaching, and I'm going to start with verse 51. I said 54. Let's go up to 51. And he gets a little upset with them, and he says, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart. They were circumcised because they were the, of the Jews. And ears, you're not hearing. You always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your father not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers. Cool, oh, he's, he, he's not cutting them no slack. Y'all the one who crucified him. Who have received the law by direction of angels and have not kept it. And when they heard this, see, they heard Peter preach. When they heard this, they were cut to the heart. Same word, they were convicted in their heart. And they gnashed their teeth at him, and, and, they, and they gnashed at him with their teeth. And, but he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of God. And they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, ran at him with one accord, and they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul, who is now the Apostle Paul. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he knelt down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. He died. One preaches the gospel, people get saved. 3,000 added to the church. Stephen preaches the gospel to the religious people. They gnash their teeth around at him, stone him to death. But guess what? Jesus was with him. Amen. He looked up into heaven, not Jesus seated at the right hand of the Father, Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. And this event changed the apostle Paul, whose name was Saul, because he saw real faith in a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. 